Hey everybody, welcome to another gear review. I've mostly been trying to get back into center lenses with manual gears and apertures, long focus throws, all that good stuff. I started by investing in three of the IRIC center lenses, the 15 millimeter, the 45, and the 150 millimeter macro. The main thing about them is that they're full frame center lenses at around $1,000 a piece, uh, which is a pretty competitive price. Um, and it turns out they're very good optically too. So I used the 15 millimeter right here as my go-to ultra wide gimbal lens. Um, it's kind of the perfect lens for gimbal shots. Uh, it's fairly short and lightweight. Um, so it works great on the Ronin S2 with the Komodo, which is what my kind of my new gimbal setup. Um, I'm also a big fan of the 45 millimeter, which I've got right here. Um, it's a nice focal length. I'm someone that rarely finds myself shooting past 50. Uh, I spend more time kind of around 24, 35 than I usually do at 50. Um, 45 is kind of a nice compromise there. Uh, slightly wider than 50, uh, makes it a great portrait length. My only real complaints about these lenses is their lens caps and lens hoods. Um, so they have this magnetic technology, which is supposed to sound fancy stuff. It's fine. It's uh, it kind of clicks into place. You know, it holds a decent amount, I guess, but you know, you can tap it off or bump it off. What it, the real problem is it keeps you from wanting to, I mean, you should never really grab a lens by the lens hood, but you definitely shouldn't grab these lenses by the lens hood. Um, so like normally if there wasn't a lens hood on it, I'm usually, it's dusty. I'm usually inclined to kind of grab it by the front element because that's where most of the weight is. Um, but you just don't want to do that with a magnetic hood on there. Even just grabbing the edges here, pushing, it can just fall right out of your hand. Um, so I'm not sure about that design. They, the, part of why they did that is they've got some magnetic uh, filters that go in the front as well. I haven't tried those. I use behind the lens filtration with the Revolva uh, ND filters. Um, you know, you know, props for trying something different. I'm just not sure. This was a good choice. I imagine a lot of people have gotten close to or maybe already have damaged their lenses just by grabbing it wrong. And, and then the other thing I don't like is the lens caps that come with them. They're really big and they're rounded. I don't know if you can see the curvature there, um, which keeps you from setting a lens down on the front element, which is how I almost always do it because that's, again, where the weight is. Um, so the center, center of gravity is lower if you set it down this way and if you set it down this way, it should be easier to top it over with. Um, so you will most certainly damage your lens if you put it down this way. And they're also, it's not the, it's not the tightest, uh, most secure lens cap. You know, it has the little buttons on it, but you can easily pull it off without the buttons. Um, and because it's so thick, it makes it easier to bump it off. Um, so again, the front, Accessories are just a little bit annoying. Um, and you know, that adds a, a solid inch almost to the front of the lens. So like you're putting it in your case, it's like it really makes it fatter than it needs to be. Another thing when I got, uh, this is a replacement rear cap I bought because when this 45 came in the mail uh, from B&H, when I ordered it, I got it right when they came out. The, uh, it came out of the box, the rear lens cap was off and one of the little plastic lips that kind of helps secure it had busted off and was like just loose in the box shaking around with it um, so I was worried that the back element would be damaged or scratched from that fortunately it wasn't um, so I didn't end up returning it everything checked out it was in good shape but I had to go buy another rear cap and I emailed IREX about it you know to let them know and also just hoping maybe they'd send me a free rear cap and they never responded to my email so not sure about the customer service but um, that should be noted as the packaging is not the best. Um, they do have these interesting little um, cutout rings that are adjustable on the side. That's basically for you, if you line that up, I don't even know if you can tell, but if you line that up with your follow focus, it just keeps it from hitting the lens. Um, it's kind of a neat thing. The focus action just on this one is a little uh, stiffer than the aperture. The aperture is a little... I don't know if you can hear that. You know, it's not the most perfect uh, sort of heavy duty sounding or feeling. It's a little 
a little light to the touch. Um, but I, I still think overall a pretty rigid lens. It is metal, I think. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's metal. It, it's got some heft to it. It feels substantial. Um, you know, it feels like a cine lens. Um, but for some reason in my mind too, when I think of them, I think of them as, I think being cheaper or lower quality than they are. I don't know if that's just from knowing the price or maybe it's just from, you know, the cheap lens caps and stuff that keep coming off makes it feel cheaper than it is. Um, I'm not really sure. It's just in my mind, I think, yeah, those are, those are kind of what they, they cost, but I think they're actually nicer than what they cost. Um, the image quality is nice. I use this 45 quite a bit. It's sort of a, uh, like I said, it's a good focal length. It's a kind of a unique focal length. And in, right now it just happens to be the fastest lens in my lens in my bag. So, you know, if I need some real shallow depth of field or, you know, it's just a good kind of workhorse lens. But the other problem with the IRX lenses is there's only four lenses so far and they're in weird parts of the range. So they have an 11 millimeter and a 15 millimeter, which is great if you were like expanding the far reaches of a kit. Uh, but it's two of the first four lenses, it seems a little strange. Um, few people I think would need both an 11 and a 15. Um, I don't have the 11, I have the 15. And then the next one's the 45, and then they have the 150 millimeter macro. Again, if you need a specialty macro and they've got it, and maybe that was their strategy is to start with the more specialty stuff. Um, but it makes it really hard to, I think, pull the trigger on buying these lenses for a lot of people because it's not a full kit. And it makes it hard to recommend them as well because it's just a weird kit right now. Um, I bit the bullet because they're cheap. Um, I used the 15 probably the most. Um, it's a great wide angle. and I. I, I I'll say it again how much I love how little it is. I mean, most wide angle lenses tend to be little, um, but I did have a Tokina 11 to 20 for a while um, in the cinema version, which is a very nice lens, but um, it is heavy and it's a little bit longer. It's a, it's a more substantial lens to put on your camera. Um, so I think there's sort of a balance is you don't want, you don't necessarily want the smallest, lightest, cheapest lens on your camera. You know, you could put a little, can and pancake on there if you if you wanted to go ultralight um, or even like the, the regular Rokinon DS lenses um, but you know I think a lot of people want to step up in quality a little but you might not necessarily want the big giant beefy super heavy you know wide angle Cine Tokina lenses um, so I felt I think this is a great compromise and it's a really good length for like I said the uh, Ronin S2 um, it's a great little handheld gimbal lens it just happens to be a perfect uh, sort of focal length for that too. So I, I almost use this exclusively as my gimbal lens, um, all the wide angle shots. Thinking both in terms of price and in terms of size and wanting to, to still use high quality Cine manual lenses, but um, you know, dial it back a little bit and, and be easier to operate run and gun, uh, you know, smaller, easier to use stuff. Um, so the IREX lenses are a great option for that. Um, the trick though is because they're slow to roll out the rest of their line, um, there's just a lot of competition. Um, I think this year they're supposed to put out a couple more, they've said, I think, but I don't know what they'll be. I'm hoping for like a 35. Um, I'm hoping they kind of do some weird ones, like 45 is kind of a weird angle. I think I'm kind of hoping for like a 32 and maybe like a 65 or a 75 instead of kind of the normal 85. Um, but we'll just have to wait and see. And there's no real idea when that stuff's going to come out, um, which is problematic if you're trying to build out a full kit. Uh, DZO Film, who earlier this year released the Pictor Zooms, which we were shooting on as well, and I'll talk about in a minute. Um, they've just released their Vespid Primes, which is a full like nine lens kit you can get. And they've got a 10th uh, 16 millimeter lens coming later this year. Um, and those individual lenses, I think, cost roughly the same as the Irixes. They're about twelve fifty or so, um, and the kits are pretty well discounted. Uh, they're very popular right now. A lot of people trying to kind of be the first people with them, um, trying to pre-order and get them out. I'm seriously considering switching over just because they're cheap and good, and I've really liked the DZO film zooms right now. Um, so I'm just kind of waiting to see almost. Kind of waiting on IREX to maybe make some announcements soon and if not um, I might be inclined to sell those and switch um, except I do really like that 15 so I don't know 
<clears throat> but yeah, so in addition to the Irexes last year, I bought the uh, DZO Pictor Zooms. I pre-ordered them before they came out. I got the special edition white ones because uh, they look really good with my special edition white Komodo. Uh, just purely a vanity thing, I guess. Um, but I sold my previous Cine Zooms, which were the Tokina Cinema ATX, the 16 to 35 and the 50 to 135, which I've also done a video for, I'll link to. Um, those are kind of older model Cine Zooms that have been around for a while. They're not the newer uh, revisions. Um, again, I love Tokina lenses, they look great. Um, but those original ATX Cine Zooms were really fat and wide and heavy. Um, they looked great. I've shot, shot my last short film with them. Um, but they're a little unwieldy, especially with the smaller Komodo. It would have looked a bit silly. Um, so I sold those, got the pick doors, and I've been really happy with the look of them. Um, they are very sharp. You can probably tell in this, especially the way I've lit this and framed it up and everything. This 8K close-up is probably annoyingly sharp. Um, but they have a really nice depth of field look. Um, there's something, they're somehow both very sort of sharp and clinical, but also have a nice artsy feel. Um, I'm gonna throw up some examples from stuff I've shot, you know, over the last few months. Um, and part of why I'm waiting, waiting six months on these is just to kind of have some examples to throw at you. Um, so in addition to the Irix B-roll, I'm gonna show you some DZO B-roll. Um, they're just really nice lenses, they, they feel, they feel higher quality than the Irixes. Just the ring motions feel a little, uh, a little more resistance, a little just more professional feeling. Um, they, they feel a lot more expensive than they are, um, is what I'll say. And they cover a nice zoom range, uh, you know, from 20 to 55 and then 55 to 125. It's 120, yeah, 125. Um, so it's like a full range. They are T2.8. Um, so if you're somebody who's been living with the, the Sigma uh, F1.8 zooms for a while, maybe that's a, a deal breaker for you. And again, the Sigmas go 18 to 35 and then 50 to 100. Um, so they're not quite as fast as those. Um, they are, I'm pretty sure they're Super 35 lenses. They are Super 35 lenses. Um, and they come with interchangeable mounts, which is sort of the only negative experience I had with them so far. Part of it might be that I was, I think I was one of the first people to get them. And so I was dealing with this problem sort of before there was sort of consensus on how to go about it. But um, it, they ship with a PL mount installed and then the box has EF mounts in it and has shims in it and a bunch of tools and screws. And uh, you know, if you're used to just switching mounts on your camera or using adapters where it's sort of, you can't really mess it up. Um, these mounts you can't mess up. <laughs> so there's about, I think there's like 10, there's a handful of screws on the back. Some like 10 screws, maybe not, maybe eight or so, something like that. Um, that you gotta unscrew, you take off the PL mount and then there's a bunch of little thin metal shims between that mount and the camera. Um, so it's been factory shimmed for PL, which means um, they're parfocal, and if you adjust those shims, then they won't be parfocal anymore. Uh, when you switch to the EF mount, you have to put different combination of shims on there to keep them parfocal at e with the EF mount. Um, and the way to do that is to set up a lens chart, measure the distance from the sensor to the chart, you know, and you kind of take a, a guess at first on how many to add or subtract, screw the eight or 10 screws back on, put it on your camera, measure the distance. And then they have a, they have a chart on their website, which is a Chinese website. So you gotta like switch to English, find this chart, download it, find this page where it tells you the, the sort of plus or minus of how many to add or subtract based on what uh, the difference when you zoom is um, and the focal length. So it gets kind of complicated. If you're a lens person, maybe that's something you deal with every day. It's the first time I've ever even used a lens chart was for this. Um, so for me, it was a lot of trial and error. Um, supposedly it's, uh, you know, it depends on the camera you're using a little bit too, though I'm not sure that makes a whole lot of sense to me. Um, but I finally got them shimmed correctly. Um, and they're both set at EF and they work perfectly on both of my red cameras. But the other problem was that the airplane is flying over and messing with my sound. 
That's the problem. Now, but the other problem is that the rear element of the lens protrudes ever so slightly from the EF mount, um, which I didn't notice immediately, except when I went to put it on my uh, red helium camera with my revolver mount on it and it wouldn't attach. It wouldn't go far enough back. It would rub against the revolver by like millimeters. My first thought was, well, maybe I messed up the shims and if there, you add more shims, maybe it'll decrease that protrusion. That turned out not to be the case. It turned out to be that these lenses, for whatever reason, are just, I guess, slightly designed poorly and that they extend too far. And, I, and I, I looked through all my other lenses, all my other EF lenses. I'm an EF shooter. I couldn't find another single lens that came close to protruding out from the mount. Um, almost every EF mount, uh, lens I have goes pretty deep in, into the lens from the mount rather than poking out. Um, uh, started noticing, uh, posting about it on the Facebook groups and figured it out and uh, eventually reached out to Kipper Tai about it, um, who makes the mount. Um, and they got a set of the lenses too and figured they were going to be pretty popular lenses. They identified the same problem on their end decided to modify their mounts by basically cutting a little um, circle in there that would accommodate the extra protrusion from the lens um, by those extra little millimeters um, and makes, allows the lenses to fit. Um, other people I've seen reporting problems with them fitting with other mounts or uh, speed boosters and stuff where they're bumping, um, but at least Revolva or Kipper Tai, who makes the Revolva mounts, stepped up and, and actually adjusted their mount to fix the lens, which seems like, you know, that's very big of them to, to compensate for somebody else's mistake. Um, but after a couple of months of R and D on their end, they had to make the new mounts and stuff. And so I got these lenses in July or August and probably wasn't, I don't think I was using, I couldn't use both on both cameras at the same time without making one EF and one PL and then putting a PL mount on my red to use that one lens for, um, for a couple of months. Um, so I went up and running the way I wanted it to be for a few months because of that design flaw. But now it's all working w well. I've got revolver mounts on both cameras. I've got the EF mounts on both DZO lenses and they're both attaching fine and they look great. Um, so yeah, it was a little bit of headache up front, but that might've also just been part of being an early adopter. Um, and now I'm very happy with the images that they make. And part of that, you know, part of the experience of, of really enjoying how these DZO film lenses look is, is, is a big reason why I'm also considering switching from the Irixes to the Vespids. Um, but I haven't, I haven't tested any of the Vespids. I can't confirm or deny how good they are. The main thing is they're slower than the Irixes. They're, they're all T2.1 lenses, uh, where the Irixes, at least in the, the middle range of the section, um, our T1.5, or at least one of them is. We don't, we don't even know what the other lenses are going to be yet, which is part of the problem. Um, so the, the Vespids aren't quite as fast, but, um, you know, cameras are more sensitive today than they've ever been, and they're getting better with low light and higher ISOs and stuff. So being that extra little bit faster might not really ultimately matter that much with modern cameras. Um, the Vespids also appear to be pretty small, which is appealing too for gimbal work and uh, you know, just being lightweight and easy to carry around. So I'm kind of itching to try them out. They're just now starting to ship out in the world. We'll see what happens. Um, I'm, I've been known to switch lenses frequently. If you follow this channel, you know that pretty well. Um, so yeah, I do like the Irixes. There's not, it's, it's almost like there's nothing, the, the only good reason to, for me to really abandon them right now is mainly just because there's not um, a full kit um, and maybe I'll mix and match a little I don't know maybe I'll just buy a single Vespid to try first like a 35 or something to fill that gap um, but uh, yeah that's my take I, I think you know it might be a little counterintuitive to uh, you know some people might be seeing DZO film which is a weird name for a brand they're a Chinese company it seems a little sketchy almost. Um, who's a startup com Chinese company making these weird sounding lenses? Um, but I'll vouch for the, at least the Pictor zooms are, are pretty outstanding lenses. I really, really like them. Um, and so uh, they, they won my vote to, 
the cheap Chinese lenses are, are some of the best I've ever used. So um, we shall see how the best bits play out, whether I'll switch or not. Uh, you know, my kit's always been a little funky too. I've still got that one ultra wide broken on SP 10 millimeter. I've got three different Sigma art series zooms, the, the still ones that have autofocus because the Komodo also has autofocus. So I've got the 1835 for that. I've got the 24 to 70, and then I've got a super uh, long range 150 to 600, I think, ultra zoom. Um, so, you know, I'm always trying different things. And I think at the end of the day, that's important to keep in mind too, is that, um, you know, if you're making good content, nobody gives a damn what lens you're using. Um, lenses can be fun to play with, um, but don't, don't overthink it and don't get too far down the rabbit hole of like, what lens should I use? Um, we're kind of in the golden age of camera gear right now. Um, pretty much any lenses on the market right now are good lenses, good enough. Uh, they'll get the job done. Um, it's kind of like, almost like picking out a loaf of bread at the grocery store. It's like, there's a thousand different kinds and they all kind of do the same thing. It's just kind of personal preference or taste or, you know, um, it, it's micro differences really ultimately at the end of the day. So don't get too carried away in YouTube videos talking about lenses. Um, you know, use what works and focus on making something good rather than making something with the best stuff. Yeah, the lens you have today is more useful than the one you're waiting on to come out tomorrow. Um, so yeah, thanks for watching. If you have any more questions, comment, and I will try my best to answer them. Subscribe if you want. I don't do these very often. So, you know, about every six months is kind of where I'm at right now. So if you're looking for to subscribe to something more active, don't bother with this channel. And this video is really just about as much as, uh, it's as much about me testing out my own stuff in an active set environment as it is about um, sharing what I know. So this is sort of a live demonstration I'm learning as I go. Uh, but yeah, if you enjoy it, let me know. And uh, thanks for watching. Goodbye. I do have one more little thing to say that I forgot about, I forgot to mention. These rubber lens caps, they're good lens caps. They're better than the, uh, I like them a lot better than the IREX ones. But uh, a white kind of plastic uh, lens cap is not good for black shading with. Just keep that in mind if you get the white set. Uh, this lets a lot of light through. Um, so when you look at your lens, you can still see a bit of light. Uh, I think I can turn that around actually and show you. Yeah, so you see that? That's it. I just opened it up wide open, you know. That's what a black screen looks like. It should look like with that on there. If I open the lens up, let the light in, that's what it's, you can see my fingers through it. Um, so yeah, just definitely don't black shade. Uh, wait, do it with the lens off before you put the lens on.